Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. We'll have a brief announcements period, then our speaker will speak. He has a long presentation tonight, so I'd like to keep the announcements and it's stuck down to a minimum. After his presentation, we'll have a question and answer period. And then after that, our infamous rebuttals period, where you guys will get a little chance to uh, Bob Lichtenberg. Bob, if you're ready, let's get you set yeah, up. Yeah, let's hear it. Come on. Oh boy, Bob. Hurry up, man. Why? They didn't respect me. They act like jerks. If you're going to act like a jerk, you're going to get over. You stand in front of that and all the name and you say, what? Yes, this is some one for coming. Great that the college could still continue all these years, mostly thanks to the single-handed efforts of Charlie. We're not too fond of right now, but <laughs> uh, some of you might have noticed <clears throat> I got a haircut, but um, I didn't get a haircut. I got all my hairs cut. Yeah. Okay, move it on so we can get to the content yeah. of the speech. Uh, I'm all cut. <clears throat> yeah, it's cheaper than lowering my ears. Lowering, lowering your ears makes your hair look shorter, but I didn't do that. In the back, I have a Seekers flyer for the next Seekers. A dialogue will be on my bungalow. I'll be on uh, logic, how logic can help us think. <clears throat> Uh, I believe that's November 30th, the last Friday of the month, flyers back there. Um, okay. The title of my talk tonight is Getting Meaning from uh, by Interpreting Our Works. A lot of these ideas are expressed in my books, <coughs> Making Meaning <coughs> Published by X Libris and um, Maximizing Meaning published by Ingram, uh, the world's biggest book distributor. And a new edition is coming out this week called Making More Meaning, the fourth edition. Um, and I thank Doug Binkley a lot for helping me with that. I'd never be able to do that myself. you got to be a book publisher to be able to publish on Ingram. Um, <clears throat> When was your first edition published? Well, that was back in, I believe it was uh, uh, October, oh, November 2017. Okay. I might have been 16, I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> not sure. If any of you would like to buy a copy, I'd be glad to sell it to you. Okay. They're only $10 cheap. Um, Okay, let's begin our talk. Where to begin with all this artwork? Well, first I'm going to begin with a little bit of, you know, with the whole history of art. <laughs> it's a long time. It goes back to the caves of Last Skull, where um, people drew animals on the cave wall, because they were so important to them, and their survivor, survivor, survival. Well, let me start a little bit with, um, Sorry, let me start with talking a little bit about how to interpret art and get meaning out of it. Okay, I wouldn't have them my hand out for tonight, guys, because I was trying to give people something to take away, because I know people don't remember. Well, I don't remember much after talks, but if I have something to file away, I'll remember a lot more of it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, art is a great way of making getting meaning, because art has a lot of imagination, a lot of creativity, and I'm going to talk about those, especially imagination, a little later. And uh, meaning is um, positive impact, the positive impact of, of uh, anything or anyone. 
and today it's going to be out on um, us and the viewer and the perceiver. I'm not going to talk much about meaning. I've talked about that before uh, here and other places, and it's in my books. And uh, I would define art. What is art? I define art as uh, anything that is um, matter has to be matter. Even a poem has to be words written on a page. And this matter, um, some physical form, uh, expresses uh, feelings and ideas, usually new ideas, many new ideas, creative ideas that come out of the arts. But mostly, arts are all about expressing emotions or feelings. The whole range of emotions, grand emotions, uh, like, for example, the music, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which is uh, to join. Even though um, this interpretation I got from Doug Binkley, and it's in my book, if we call out the God and God did not respond, he still finds joy in human creativity and the brotherhood of all humans. And I want to thank Doug a lot for, again for helping me produce the book. Um, okay, but the emotions can be usually negative, but they're often positive. They could be like uh, Mozart's way to be a master. His father is domineering father. Very sad, but that needs to be expressed too. But art is mostly expressing the feelings and emotions, not ideas. And it's very good at that. Convey very specific emotions, like is this uh, music pessimistically sad or resignedly sad, or what, any kind of different kinds of sorrow could be very precise. As Aaron Copeland says, the composer <clears throat> who I once saw, <laughs> uh, he, um, okay, um, uh, well, um, Okay, it's very hard to name these emotions. And you can name them in general, but it's very hard to name them specifically. But that doesn't matter so much. The main thing is to feel them. It's to feel these emotions fully. Um, yeah, and look for the ideas in there and the life truths that they express as opposed to big facts. Um, that we get elsewhere. Um, and a lot of these paintings I'm going to show and sculptures are, are show people, artists, trying to find ways that we can know reality and see reality as it really is. And that's not as easy as it sounds. It's really quite difficult. And they have ingenious ways of doing it. Uh, some of them. <laughs> Not all. Some are doing simpler things. Um, okay, to interpret an artwork means to explain to you its meaning. You know, what significance it has for you, what importance it has for you. And this will give you a lot of meaning because it states your views about an artwork. Not many people have them, and what I always told my students is our stupid society. We live in a very stupid society. <clears throat> it doesn't care whatsoever about ideas. All he cares about is things and money and getting stuff. You know, what they could see, and that's pretty much it for most people in society today. But if, if you're able to interpret an artwork, you can get a lot of meaning out of it, as well as signify something special to you. <clears throat> Rather than being an enigma, or what the first mayor daily, he called that an enema. <laughs> Um, no, but he meant enigma. Uh, a lot of art is an enigma, it's enigmatic to a lot of people. Um, and because it's so very different from our utilitarian things, from the things that we use in everyday life, very different from those. Puzzling to us. All right, the first step in interpreting an artwork is to uh, is to know something about it. <laughs> and this will leave a lot of people out. I mean, they offend anyone, but uh, like in the suburbs, there's almost no art. 
uh, much less much knowledge about it, about nothing here is from the suburbs. But try and find out in the suburbs, it's not easy. It's not easy at all. There's very little of it out there. There's not much in the city. <laughs> you really have to work hard for it. Not for our desire to find it. So try and know something about an artwork, get a little knowledge, something that will intrigue you. And uh, this could be, you know, something about the artwork itself, its place in art history, its um, symbols, the artist's intention. There's a lot of other things you can know about it. Try to put an, an artwork in its context in as many ways as you can. Try to analyze each of the parts and then put the parts together into a whole. And you'll see it's kind of like a living home, an organic home, as they, they call it, as statisticians call it. Those are people interested in philosophy of art. Um, but a lot of our works are very provocative on purpose and raise questions that you should seek to answer, being led by your feelings and most curiosity. But our works often give answers too, that's the main thing. That's why I'm going to try and emphasize the answers that are here in the works <coughs> of um, Second step in interpreting our works is to use your imagination. I define the imagination as the human ability to make images, to make an image, to make a picture. Here's the um, visual, could be verbal too, of course, but this is one of the highest faculties of the human mind, is to imagine something that's not there, or well, take an image and do something with it. Thank you. Um, I see something in your mind's eye. Cicero put it, I studied Cicero <laughs> in third year of Latin, and that was one, one of the best things I ever studied was Latin because it helped me to understand the roots, concrete roots of a lot of words and numbers. Um, okay, but even I, Einstein appreciated the imagination that so takes us away from the constraints of physical existence. And yeah, he was very good at this, of course. Um, the imagination can be very powerful. Uh, it can even um, confuse people for a reality. And some people have a very hard time distinguishing between the two. Um, like people hallucinating on drugs. Or people who are psychotic have a hard time distinguishing between the physical world and and uh, their own internally created world. Um, but um, the imagination can create a lot of joy, but it can also create a lot of suffering for people, like psychotic, it can create crippling fears. But art generally makes a better world than the physical world because the artist can improve on reality if he wants. Like in paintings, many portraits are a lot better than the people painting. And a lot of part paintings of nature also show um, nature as better than it looks physically. Imagination uh, tends to, is real prominent in young people. I mean, it tends to die out as we get older. It goes more and more into the background. Um, but the imagination can expand widely once you're given something, um, once it's given something to uh, um, expand on, like knowledge about an artwork, and the artworks are so rich that they can suggest a lot of um, interpretations if you have a vivid imagination or a strong imagination and a little knowledge. But we can't give any rules for how to interpret a work of art uh, because this, this depends on um, what the philosopher Immanuel Kant said uh, called, called the free play of imagination. Imagination likes to play around and create images, but we can't give any rules for this. 
Um, now, there could be more interpretations of an artwork than there are artworks themselves. Um, because you can make more than one interpretation yourself. And that's okay, that's fine, that's great. And all interpretations are welcome. As long as they're based somewhat on the artwork itself and don't come out of nowhere. Um, but um, we can't say any interpretation is the best one because you can always make a better one when you get more knowledge about an artwork and use your imagination more, which you can always do. Okay, that's a big overview of how to interpret art. Uh, what is art? How, what is meaning? And how, um, first, you got to get a little knowledge, and then you got to use your imagination to interpret any artwork. Any questions about that? Questions or comments? Yeah, Peter. There's about 40 slides, so you have about one minute per slide. Oh, well, I have no idea how long that's going to take. It took you 25 minutes for the introductory now. remarks alone. Pardon me? It took you about 25 Wait, minutes for the introductory remarks. Let's move on, thank you. Uh, okay, let's start with the slides then. Uh, where do you start in the whole history of art? Well, last uh, Monday, uh, or was it Sunday? It was Veterans Day, and my first artwork will be the Vietnam Veterans. Uh, sorry, Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C. A controversial work regarding the controversial war, the Vietnam War. Uh, as you can see here, let's see, I don't know it's, it's so uh, long up. and low. It does get higher, but not real high. It's a very unusual monument. It has inscribed on it the names of all the uh, victims that I said, you know, of, uh, who died in the Vietnam War. Um, and that includes eight women, but it was over 58,000 men who died in that war. And their names are written there, and that's the monument. They're written on mar marble, polished marble, so your, your face is reflected back on the image. I'm uh, saying that you're, you're involved in it, you're a part of it. Um, of all wars and of the um, country itself. Uh, uh, Use a scroll wheel. How do I get it bigger? Scroll wheel on a mouse. Scroll, oh, okay. All right, the next uh, image is called Madonna of the Gardens. You're probably wondering where the Madonna is in the gardens <laughs> in this painting. We'll see a, a more realistic version of this theme a little later. But this one is a difficult work of art, of course, by um, Paul Clay, a Swiss painter, uh, who wanted to do things differently. I won't say much about it, just that um, he's trying to have fun with different color fields and taking traditional images and doing things differently. Here he's taking Mary's face, the Madonna, Mary, and rearranged it and put it sideways as her mouth, her eyes, her nose, her ears. And she's holding the infant Jesus, uh, represented by this triangle, which kind of represents the Trinity, which you see a little bit here. And um, um, there's five circles representing the infant Jesus, and I have no idea what those means. Probably that Jesus was a mystery to Clay. And um, Mary's both walking toward you and walking away. This painting, Clay's just trying to have fun. Um, is that number four? That's not Is that the number four? It looks like a four. I think it's kind of a triangle that we see prominently in other Madonna's. Playing around with the Trinity idea, this is Mary's arm extended outward to present uh, Jesus to us. But like I say, he's having fun, and I hope this will be fun. I had well, lots of fun presenting, presenting this, uh, preparing for this lecture, this talk. All right, the next artwork is by um, 
great Spanish painter, um, Don, sorry, Goya, Francisco Goya. And I put this up first, cause, well, as I said, these paintings aren't in any order, but I think this one's fitting, because some of us might have left our kids at home <laughs> to come to this talk, but most of us are too old for that. But, um, well, what is, what is this uh, young man doing here? Uh, Goya got a lot of money to paint, paint this painting. And um, it's really, again, poking fun at the kid. Uh, uh, he's given a sickly color, a death like pale color, with no life. He's got these gaudy clothes on. Looks like a girl. And what is he doing? Playing with the yo yo. Playing with the yo yo. No, yo yo, he's got a magpie, a bird on a string. And he's using it to tease these cats in the background. And these cats, of course, have an instinct to jump and kill the bird. Um, but he's going to yank it away soon. But in case a bird does, sorry, a cat does catch and kill a bird, he's got a supply of birds back here. Okay, so these could symbolize, as I say, our souls, which are really free. Um, but not after caged up like this young man's life was and will be. All right, this is a painting at the Art Institute. Many of my paintings come from the Art Institute called The Rock. And uh, it, has a, it has a circular form. You see the circle? You go around in a circle. In the background, you see what looks like a nuclear holocaust. This nukes were dropped on Japan during the Second World War. And you see the destruction and the, 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 civil, the, the devastation of the old order, the, the picture of someone's mother, uh, Coca-Cola sign. I don't know why there's white smoke. It looks clean coming out of there. But there are workers trying to rebuild the civilization. But it looks like they're not going to do it. <coughs> because look at that building, it looks like it's going to fall and collapse. It doesn't look solid. There's no solid foundation anymore. I don't have any idea we, we all agree on. Um, and the rock in the center, upper center, represents a shattered globe. The earth. There's some strange growth that would come about from a nuclear holocaust some kind of strange animal. She might seem to be worshiping the, the, the rock, but she's really grabbing a root, looking for something to eat. Um, okay. Oh, hmm. Just to use your scroll wheel, Bob. I'm not going to say much about this. This is um, John Singer Sergeant, called Carnation Lily, Lily Rose. You can see the flowers in the background. These various flowers and these. Does the prior painting sell with their dolly? The, the prior painting called what? The prior painting, was that done by Salvador Dolly? Not that I know of, perhaps. I don't think so, though. No, I don't think so. Uh, again, uh, Sergeant got a lot of money to paint this one. He's showing young girls hanging uh, tiki lights in the garden. And he paints with great skill. He's an excellent realist. He's very good at texture. You can tell the, um, uh, the, the clothing is kind of silkish. Um, the only, and, and the artist recently had a major show on John Singer Sargent, but the problem with Sargent is he really doesn't have anything to say. He has no social message. He just has a lot of skill, great technical skill and painting. Oh, now that's just a close-up of uh, Vietnam War met uh, veterans, um, so Vietnam War Memorial in D.C. And you can see some of the names inscribed there. That's not a place. There's the Parthenon. It's not a restaurant, but a temple in Athens, Greece, now fully restored. Looks a lot better than it does here. I saw these other temples, but the Parthenon is the birthplace of Western philosophy. Western 
democracy, there was a democracy that started then, and Western civilization and the ideas regarding Western civilization all began shortly from the um, part of now where Socrates used to roam and question people and seek wisdom. Um, and started philosophy, Western philosophy. The next, on the next page is Woman of Avignon by Picasso. Um, kind of a Cubist painting. What he's done is taken a classical French painting um, and made the women distorted. And he's given the two in the left African mass grotesque ones that he recently saw an exhibit in Paris. And as I say, he's probably getting revenge on the whores there who uh, didn't stay with him. Um, next is another painting from the Art Institute, one of the more popular one, the famous one, where people up in congregate called Paris a rainy day. And people are united mostly by the adversity of the rain. There's groups of people under the umbrellas showing that people do come together when there's trouble, although there's a solitary man right in the middle. Uh, and the new development is pointing at this. Um, but you can see that, the, that development from the old crooked pair of streets is way too big. There's going to be way too congested. Um, and I like how Kaibal was able to make paint look like rain. It looks like water to me. I don't know how painters do stuff like that. Okay, Andy Warhol. Um, Campbell soup cans. Uh, Warhol came to fame shortly after World War II when he was trying to protest how materialistic the U.S. had become and how lacking of individuality we have all become in our materialism. Um, the only thing different about here, these are the ingredients. Once uh, Warhol opened one of these cans of soup, and uh, what was inside of it? Nothing, nothing. So Warhol was a satirist of American society and in the pop, pop culture, a critic of it. And how everywhere we go, we're manipulated. By marketing, it's everywhere, advertising's all over the web, all over TV, all over the media. All right, this is a painting I myself love personally. I have a reproduction of it. Wow. My gun, and my bungalow, Cezanne, a basket of apples. Who um, painted this picture? Cezanne. Mm. Uh, and you notice how he distorts the perspective. This one is different from this one over here. It looks like all these things are going to fall off, but somehow he anchors them with the wine bottle in the center and the sculpture of fall to the clock. Um, here, these are some strange cookies. Said to be cookies. They look like cookies to me. Uh, of red, they look like small ones. <laughs> but it takes a new perspective. Oh, no, sorry. Um, Warhol, and again, that one doesn't belong there. That's Warhol. Doing the same thing with Coca Cola bottles as he did with Campbell soup cans. Okay, this is. Um, Anyway, this is out of order. Sure, I'm sorry. I'm going to skip this. They're abstract there. Let this come up later. Um, no, I'm sorry. This is not going there. Okay, this is the assumption of the Virgin by El Greco, or is really a Greek. We see the Virgin Mary or something sending on a crescent moon, which symbolizes 
for purity. Uh, down below are the apostles who went to her tomb. <laughs> And uh, I recently found out they are debating about her assumption into heaven. Um, I often thought that they weren't really seeing the assumption, except this one guy here who's looking at uh, her, looking above. Looking up. All right. Um, this is a sculpture, Walking Man by Giacometti. Um, and this is um, post-World War II, he's trying to re recreate a human image, and this is what he comes up with. As an emaciated, very thin, tall man, he's starving for meaning, he's looking for meaning after the destruction of World War II. Uh, ruined uh, almost all of Europe, European civilization, but he, his head is erect. And um, he's walking firmly, taking a big stride toward an unknown goal. He has big hands to do the work that he needs to do. And I, I don't know why he has big feet, too. He has club feet. And Giacometti gave the sculptures, bronze. And um, <clears throat> um, they. Um, Never got together in a group. He could never get them into together into a group, and that's a big problem still today. Jack and May never very, couldn't, couldn't bring them together. All right, this is a famous painting by Picasso of Wernicke, named after a village in northern Spain, where the dictator Franco, in cooperation with the Nazis, dropped bombs on his uh, village of Wernicke. Um, and there's all kinds of symbols, and it's a protest against the unjust bombing. As I mentioned, there's a glaring light, and it looks like a bomb exploding. There's shards of glass. There's a horse screaming, a symbol of Spain. I don't know why he has a pointed tongue. <laughs> there's a bull also symbolizing Spain, and the bull fights. Um, but again, the bull is the only part of a bull. Here you have a mother wailing, weeping for her dead child killed in the bombing, and she's in the she has the triangular trinity form that the uh, traditional sculptures of the Virgin Mary have had. There's all kinds of rich symbolism in this uh, painting, a mural in Picasso. These might be the first computer. Remember these. I don't know if you're old enough to remember the first computer printouts, cards look like that. Or these could be newspaper accounts of the um, uh, of the bombing of Wernicke. Uh, here we have a dead man. His eyes are knocked to the side. And his uh, sword is broken, showing he's defeated by this unjust bombing. This is a painting. By Ivan Albright called into the soul, into the world came a soul named Ida, uh, and um, Albright was a medical illustrator during World War One, and he saw a lot of ravages and destroyed flesh, and he became pretty much obsessed with it the rest of his life, and that's what he's trying to show. Here we see Ida trying to apply powder to cover her drooping flesh. Uh, and it's almost de decomposing. You see the um, bumps and bruises that she's got all her lifetime, and everything's at an angle, but it's very detailed. Um, and it just shows um, in a painstaking way the effects of time and decay on this forlorn woman. And all of us, we all get one day older, and what have we done with the day? And what good do our possessions do us? Okay, a very abstract painting, one of the first by Wazley Kandinsky. 
Who was in the school, the Blue Rider? They, um, they tried to ride into heaven. Um, by becoming abstract, by revolting against materialism, too. Over here, you see a lot of more vertical. Um, but, well, symbols of war, and on the right side, you see more, um, is more peaceful. He was trying to get a pure painting. And he was the first one to make abstract art, according to me. He did it in 1909. Um, oops, <laughs> that doesn't belong in there either. I'll just comment on this. Uh, uh, this is a painting by Man A called Luncheon on the Grass. And you notice there's a nude woman here, but there's two fully clothed men. They're not even paying attention to the fact that she's nude. There's an old painting in the background, much more innocent. And I like the way Manet makes the perspective almost vertical here. He makes, um, you know, the luncheon look. She shows it from the top, the rest is shown on the side. Warren him later. That must have been quite a lunch. <laughs> I think it was quite a lunch, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, this is Raphael, a painting of his called Madonna of the Gardens. Wait, is that the name? No, it's, um, it's a Madonna bow with the infant Jesus and John the Baptist. Raphael is being a messenger to the coming of Jesus, and that's what John the Baptist was. Uh, and you see Mary's face has remained the image of female beauty for many generations. Uh, although she's much chubbier <laughs> than our image of beauty now, a little chubbier than that. Than our current image of beauty, which is almost anorexic. All right, another famous painting at the Art Institute, Night Hawks by Edward Hopper. It shows a greasy spoon diner um, in, a, in a big city late at night. It's not my diner. And the people are kind of um, not really interacting, although these two are together. Who did this? Edward Hopper. 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 Yeah, Hopper. Hopper, he was mostly affected on uh, uh, trying to show the effects of life. It's dark late at night. But you see this triangular shaped restaurant is cutting through the night and shedding light on the, on the dark sidewalk. The light is the first fluorescent light. Um, they were just invented at that time. And um, this, to me, expresses the essence of urban loneliness and isolation, although Hopper says, well, he didn't say, he didn't thought it expresses the loneliness of the big city pretty well. All right, this one's not in the Art Institute, but it is in Chicago, and I'm sure a lot of, almost all of you have seen that. It's called The Bean. It's in Millennium Park. Which is a great accomplishment by Daly, the second Daly, to build that with a lot of modern art in it. Good art. The bean, uh, which is what it's called, but the artist really is modeling liquid mercury in it, which does take that shape. Uh, this does reflect the city. <coughs> Here you see landscapes, which are in the back. In the back, but in front of it is the lakefront, which I say is the best lakefront or the best waterfront anywhere in the world because it's all devoted to public parks and recreation. It doesn't have shipping and all that junk on it like most waterfronts do in big parks. And Chicago's waterfront is open for many miles. 
And the bean is a reflection of that. Um, Next, we have the P.A. taught by Michelangelo, in which Mary beholds the crucified Jesus. His body is painful. She looks very young. She has a full-grown son, 33 years old. And she looks very sad. She's offering him to us. Um, but the amazing thing about this is how lifelike it looks. Well, Michelangelo somehow got the um, marble to look like flesh. Again, I don't know how he does it. It's excellent. Um, it's excellent skill. I see what you're doing. Um, again, it's Plato, one of the few philosophers I admire. Probably my favorite, favorite philosopher. All right, this is Jackson Pollock called Great Rainbow. Um, Pollock was not a very good <laughs> drawer. He couldn't draw very well. Um, so he gave that up, and he tried a totally new technique. He would splatter paint or drip paint in a trance, sometimes drunken. Uh, he learned this from the Indians of the Southwest, where he came from. And um, <clears throat> this would express his subconscious mind, which is a mess. So was, so was ours. So was mine. <laughs> and he splattered this paint here over uh, the colors of the rainbow, but you could barely see them. Uh, but this is a very new technique. Very revolutionary. Something nobody else ever thought of. Um, it's also probably one of the freest techniques because um, Pollock did not dictate where the paint would go. The paint would fall by gravity. And not where Pollock said it would go. So he arrived at something very original. Um, very creative at the time. And a lot of us you know, don't appreciate how original this material was. All right, this is Mark Wathko. Um, who paints color fields. And that's the vision he arrived at after trying to um, see how we see. And he just simplifies it to a bunch of colors. And he makes them radiate. Uh, Goodman Theater did a play by Rothko called Red. Some other theater is playing it. I don't think it's a Goodman. Um, but again, it's a radical technique, changing painting to make it reflect more what we, how we see the basis of how we see it. Right, here's one of my favorite painters, Monet. And he's painting this cathedral at Rouen, in the village in northern France. And the, the cathedral is clearly the biggest structure around for many miles, but... Um, it's like Notre Dame de Paris. Notre Dame de Paris. You know, oh, no, this, uh, no, 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 this is Rouen Thomas? Cathedral. It's in a village north of Paris. Is that what you were asking, Alana? Yeah. yeah. No, this is north of Paris. Um, well, it's the biggest edifice for many miles. But you could see how Monet is changing it to a play of sunlight. And it becomes mostly that. And he's dissolving it into the sunlight. Um, and we'd go down there different times of day and paint this cathedral in different ways at night. And um, it would be appear very differently, just as it does to us. And he's trying really to revolt against photography, which was an up-and-coming art. Oh, maybe more on that later. 
a little bit more about Monet. Oh, sorry, this is a go. Can go. We have no water. There at the end. Why don't I go to the water bottle quickly? Oops. I'll talk about most of these paintings in a while. All right, this is Monet Water Lilies. He um, was very successful as a painter, and he had, he had his own gardens. Okay. Ah! They're too big, Tim. How do I get it? Small. Just, just put down the mouse, Johnny. Uh, Appetite. All right. I don't know I need to go backwards when it's going forwards. Click the other side, click the other, uh, left, left click on the mouse. The arrows work? We Sorry. might try it. I'm a dinosaur on the computer. Oh yeah, no, 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 this way. Oh, yeah. Oh, You're going back. Yeah, that's what I want to do. Okay, Monet would go down to the, his lily pond, his pond that he had on his estate, uh, and he would paint the water lilies. Now, why did he do that? I didn't touch anything. Um, he'd paint them at different times of the day. Different, why is it doing that? Because she got it on slideshow mode. And eventually, as I say, he merged them all into one endless blue vapor. Everything became one. That was his vision at the end of his long life. Although, maybe he suffered from cataracts. Here's Vincent Van Gogh. There's a good movie out and coming out on him while I'm here. What's he doing there? Uh, um, all right, uh, this is a self-portrait of him. Does anyone know how to stop it from moving? Uh, it keeps moving on them. Just hit the escape key. Use a hammer. There you go. All right, sorry about that. Mango self-portrait. You can see here, He's a, he's a man who's deeply troubled. He's falling apart mentally. You see these lines radiating. These are points that were becoming a popular style of painting. And you see how they're all coming outward from his head as a man falling apart mentally. Uh, you can see the, the fixed glare in his eye. It's, um, it's like he's afraid of you. <laughs> Being persecuted and unloved. He loved painting people's eyes. He preferred those to cathedrals. He, he wrote to his beloved brother, Theo. Uh, but his own eyes were scared. Um, why don't I go to a starry night? No. No, no, I think I'll end up a starry night. Yeah. Um, Okay, next we have another popular painting at the Art Institute in Island. Uh, Sunday on the Island, there was a play about this at the Goodman also many years ago. But this is, um, uses uh, thousands and thousands of little dots of uh, atoms that are colored, which they aren't really, but they make a um, the scene of an ordinary Sunday, the people recreating, this is the artist himself. Um, I don't know what this is here. This looks like my dark blue. <laughs> Here's someone but playing his bugle in the, on this island off of Paris. Uh, but uh, nobody's really paying attention to him. Uh, there's a lot of circles and a lot of semicircles. Look at the bustle of this woman. That's a huge bustle. You see how important fashions are. She has a monkey or a chimpanzee on a leash, which um, apparently 
was a fashion at that time too for the rich to show that you're rich. But uh, yeah, yeah we, we wonder who these people are, but he's made them kind of eternal by giving us all these circles. Yeah, maybe it's a pet monkey. And um, we're, we're fascinated by who they are. On the island. All right, now we can go to the uh, Far East. It's actually a Cambodian sculpture in about 10th century by an unknown Cambodian sculpture. Sculpture is the goddess Shiva. And she's dancing in a ring of fire. They're not very good at portraying fire <laughs> back to them. But they are quite good at the human figure, quite sexualized. And, the body. and I love the way she has four arms. You never see this in Western art, never. Uh, but it's common in Hindu um, theology. Uh, this arm is raised to tell you not to be afraid. This leg is raised show enlightenment, as I say, this foot is stamping on ignorance. Shiva is doing your dance, and it's a dance of both creation and destruction. She creates the illusion of the universe. It's just an illusion. It just appears for a while. And then she destroys it with her dance, and then it's reborn and purified. <clears throat> Again, according to Hindu theology. All right. Has anyone one. seen this painting before? I think, so. show that. I think Sid Cohen might have, but he's not here tonight. It's just to be on a box of cigars called Dutch Master Cigars. <laughs> but this is a painting by Rembrandt and shows you interrupting a meeting of uh, different businessmen. These are the first businessmen. They might be working for a city in Amsterdam, where you're, you, you come into their meeting and they show their different personalities. This one's kind of all hum, this one is kind of um, looking suspiciously at you. This one is still engaged in business. He's calculating still the money. This is a, um, I don't know who that is. I don't think it's a businessman. He might be a servant. He doesn't have a big collar. He doesn't have a hat. Yeah. And he's not much engaged. He kind of looks like he's um, doesn't want to be there. This guy's confronted you directly too. And this guy is a real businessman. He's grabbing the stack of money. He's suspicious. I love the gorgeous colors, the warm reds and browns that Rembrandt. We probably could best reveal human traits than any, anyone ever could. Okay, this is the bar at the Follies Bergerer by Manet, again, not Monet, Manet. Much more realistic than Manet. But this shows a woman, the barmaid primarily, probably a hooker, may have had to be. But notice her reflection in the mirror is much different from the image she's giving to you as, as you confront her. Now, I can't really see it on this. I don't want to click on it. But you're in there too. And you can't really see it on one. You can't really see it there, but there's a man looking at her. Uh, this is a nightclub in Paris, place of entertainment. The mirror is reflecting a balcony. Now, why would it do that? The balcony is higher and the mirror is not tilted. Now, over here on the right, our right, you can see some glass and that reflects a lot of images of the room, but you can't really see them in this, in this reproduction. Um, Okay, and he's just playing around with how we see things and he's making a lot of puzzles. 
asking us, do we really see what we think we see? Isn't that really very different from what we see? Um, he's interrogating and he's raising questions about the act of seeing himself. Okay, it's another famous painting by Michelangelo. Lots of fresco on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. He had to lay on his back for years to paint this. Uh, so I actually moved on this called The Agony and the Ecstasy. And it's based on a book by Michelangelo. But here we see the creation of Adam, the first man. And Adam is nude totally. <laughs> Excuse me the women here. He's very limply holding out his hand. We see the energy from God, who's depicted as an old man with a gray beard, cloaked in the swirling cloth. God is giving life to Adam to his creation in the background. Some, um, someone the physician noticed how Michelangelo has depicted the human brain here in these figures. One of them is Eve. And um, this physician also points out how this shows the human uterus. Almost done. <clears throat> this is the start of the modern age, the age of anxiety. I Munch, and this is um, something that um, Munch actually felt himself, much anxiety. And you can see the skull-like figure is holding his hands, and he looks like a skeleton. Um, and this is an actual event. He just left his two, two friends. We don't even notice him anymore, but he, he feels much anxiety. And the beautiful Norwegian sunset becomes a blood red sky. Okay. Wow, well, this is an on your hand out. I have to call two sisters. Well, here's a palette for the colors, the bright colors. Pretty woman and girl, young girl, apparently dashed in the paint. It's made to look like she has colorful flowers on her hair. It's impressionist painting of Paris in its happy days. Um, not so happy. This is at the Art Institute too. Uncle and his niece. I dressed in black, and probably the nieces come to live with the uncle whose wife has probably died, and they have puzzled looks on their face trying to understand death, the death of probably this man's wife. Oh, Van Gogh, all the potato eaters. Um, This shows peasants in, in this Holland, where the bingo came from. And this is really a communion. There, you see the wafers, the potatoes. I like wafers. And this is the wine being poured out. This man's offering a potato, although they probably have nothing. They have very little. Being peasant farmers. OK, again, that, oh. It's not on your handout. And I think I'll end with this one. The Starry Night, a famous painting by Van Gogh. Shows this night sky alive with the presence of God. At least that's what Van Gogh saw in the night sky. He um, looked out. Um, from his asylum, mental asylum, and he saw where he was cured of his mental disease. He saw interlocking stars. I think these are shooting stars. It's hard to tell. Actually, I think I see. Now, well, there's two stars there. 
and the bright glowing suns and the crescent moon that he likes so much and the cypress tree that um, <clears throat> looks like flames uh, and this steeple of the ch small church found in most of the villages in Europe and goes vertical just as the tree does most of the pinion is horizontal the um, lights in the church are out Van Gogh wanted to be a minister but um, they wouldn't have him because <laughs> as he became so annoying. And the sleepy village isn't really observing the spectacle of the night sky. This is probably the most intense search for meaning ever. And Van Gogh search for it more than anyone did. And he did find it. And um, he did find meaning. He did find God. Too bad he was apparently killed shortly thereafter. He had only painted for five years. So, I, I hope you don't feel overwhelmed by all these paintings and all this interpretation of meaning, but um, um, thank you for your attention. Um, and um, I have questions. I'm going to take questions. You take your questions, Bob? I'm taking some questions. Well, then question. Yes. Yeah, Michael. Uh, what's your favorite picture? Not to put you on the spot. Now what? I'm sorry. Not to, not to put you on the spot. But what's your what um, favorite? you have a favorite? Yeah, it's certainly hard to pick one. It's like picking right. one's favorite child, but um, I, wanna, I like to see them. Can I ask a question? I think the best, best of apples because of how revolutionary and how bright and how actually painted it is, although it's a simple thing. Yeah, David. When was the screen uh, painted or, or printed? See, my Oh, I'm not too sure the year. Um, early 1900s, when people were becoming anxious <laughs> and admitting to the anxious, and they had the leisure to be so. <laughs> um, and it's become a huge um, epidemic since then. What uh, paintings do you? Uh, have regard for from the present decade. What Pre paintings do you have regard for from the present decade? Present decade, not much. <laughs> now paintings are spending their, um, you know, they're reproducing a lot of the revolutionary stuff and the abstract stuff that we already saw already. And it's, it's the second time it's done, it's not very appealing. The first time it's done, it's very meaningful. My artist is brave and original enough to uh, think of something different on the second time. It doesn't have nearly as much meaning. And um, many of the painters today seem to be doing that, and they're not doing the realism. Oh, I really don't have any favorite paintings from recent decades. Hello. Okay, very quick. What inspired you to give topic to the, the particular this topic you talked about? What it inspired you? Why you decided to take this topic? Inspired who? Me? Yeah, yeah. To do to, to, to the topic for speech. Inspired me to write or do what? To act or? What kind of inspiration are you? So my question, who, uh, why you decided uh, this topic? What do you like about it? So who inspire you maybe, or to encourage you to do, you know, speech today, or how, how did you choose this topic for today to speak? Oh, how did I choose the subject? Well, I think my, <laughs> my brain made me do it, the type of brain that I have. <laughs> 
There's one that likes this kind of thing. Okay, good answer. Thank you. Uh, uh, I think I have a lot of imagination. Okay, good answer. Um, and um, art has always appealed to me. It's always excited me because of its possibilities. <laughs> it's nice to escape reality all the time. Hmm. Uh, this is the kind of mind that I have. Okay. Yeah, you know, would you define art as just paintings and, and physical objects, or do you consider things like the fine art of public speaking uh, a, an art form? Well, no, as I defined art earlier, art is, um, I'm talking about the fine arts tonight. I know there's applied arts like public speaking, but no, I wasn't talking about those tonight. I'm talking about the fine arts. Um, as I defined them, they are formed expressively. It has to be something physical, like even words, but the poet does have to write a poem. <laughs> he can't have a poem just in his mind because it might not really exist. But it has to be written down on paper at least, same with literature, novels. They have to be written down and um, exist physically and then uh, the, oh, I think I omitted this in my explanation. Uh, but the, the matter has to be formed by the artist in some way. It has to be shaped. It has to be given some shape um, <clears throat> to express mostly feelings and emotions. That's what uh, paintings express. and. Um, Music also expresses, um, especially classical music is nothing but, but feelings, deep, profound feelings. I have a classification of the arts which I can give out if anyone would like one. Any other questions? Rick? I like a copy. Who's talking? You got a question? No, I want a copy. Oh. Uh. <laughs> okay. Are we ready for rebuttals? Okay, Andy, let's uh let's thank Bob Lichtenberg for his talk tonight. We're going to do rebuttals next, right? Okay, this is the famous rebuttal period. Uh, who, who wants to give a rebuttal? Raise your hand. One's over here, one's here. You want one back there? Okay, uh, we got three rebuttals. Uh, take eight minutes apiece, and then we'll get out of here. What's 15 minutes? Yeah, eight minutes. Yeah, we don't have time. Go less. There's no time. There's no time. There's no time. I'm sorry, Charlie, you're not the end. Good evening. I'm David Travis. Hi, David. If I've ever been to a more boring presentation, <laughs> I swear I can't remember it. Huh? I gave you my attention. Please give me yours. As I said, if I've ever been to a more boring presentation, I swear I can't remember it. Uh, yeah, right here. I, um... I, in the first place, the basic thesis of our speaker tonight has been interpreting art and the meaning of art. If I took five guys and asked them to uh, paint a painting, uh, I would get five different paintings that would be interpreted in many, many ways by many, many people. <coughs> you don't interpret an art, an object, the art, as having some kind of a universal meaning. And to do so is to have a very Soviet mentality. They print a certain kind of money. They say, this is what it is. This is what it'll buy. The state has spoken, and that's that. Uh, the, the point is, is that uh, art is to be 
determined by the individual. When you look at an object DR, you decide what meaning it has for you. Uh, and let's remember that John Wayne Gacy painted paintings. <laughs> so it, uh, it's not, uh, there is no universal meaning for art. Art can, a dozen critics can interpret art in a dozen different ways. Uh, I think that uh, uh, it should be left for the individual to determine what the art, what the artwork, what meaning it has for him as an individual, uh, and not to try to force it, uh, a meaning on it for everybody else. Uh, when I um, first laid eyes on Bob Lichtenberg, I thought he looked like a janitor. Oh my God. No personal attack. Oh David. 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 There's oh nothing to do with hey, oh I want to say that. You know what I, you know what you look like Will you me? shut up and No. Wait. You follow the rules. You know, no. you break the rules every week. <laughs> every no week attacks. you've got to put your two cents yeah. in. And it doesn't enhance your image. If Everybody you. has you down for just what you are. In any event, uh, I think that Mr. Lichtenberg would do very well to uh, engage in some other activity. Thank you. Who's next? I'm going next. You're not supposed to say bad things about people. It's not bad to say something yeah, that's like cool. a job. Hey, you know, yeah, what kind of thing is hey, that to say? Insult, right? Happy right, Thanksgiving Bob. What do you think you look like? The first thing I'm going to say about art is that the first thing I have to say about art is that there's a lot of good art out there. And part of what a true artist does, or a poet, is they do engage in the good art of public speaking. I'm not going to say much about it, but there is an organization that I'm a member of called Toastmasters. <laughs> and I think it would help improve you quite a bit in, in trying to convey some of these messages that you've been doing. I will refrain from any other commentary on it, but if I can get online here for a minute, I want to show you a couple of pieces of art that I really enjoy. And if we can get on here in a, in a second. But anyway, while we're getting online, I want to share a brief story that I had with a uh, former worship director at Springbrook Community Church about artists, musicians, and the mentality of art. She came up to me one time and she says, you know, Tim, you're just, a, you're just as much of an artist as any of us musicians are. And I go, why is that? Well, you shoot a lot of video, don't you? You want to do a good job on it? You want to make sure that in the time frame you try to do what you need to do? And I said, yes. I said, if, if you're given the chance, would you edit and do a lot better job than what's up online right now? And I said, probably would, but I also know people fundamentally just want to see the event. And to me, I've had to do a complete head spin because some of my own personal art that I've done is I've changed the end of movies via, via editing, the editing process. I will not show them online for obvious copyright violations reasons. But somebody had asked, is there some art over, some good art over the last 10 years? I think there is a real good, good one here. Um, let me see if I can pull it up here. We just do a simple Google image search. We come up here. And some of the stuff that has been coming up, MTV did this last year. And what they did was exactly talk about Beavis and Butthead and the caricatures of the present administration. I, honest, I honestly think if you're looking for some meaning in art, this really has to give you the, uh, how shall we say, 
the ultimate in satire. I love it. In what and what the what the what the people do. Beavis being Trump, Butthead being Pence. You can kind of see a little bit of the uh, similarities between the two characters there. The hairbrain schemes that Trump pulls out, the go along with uh, Pence in office. Yeah, I think it's a very good, accurate way that the administration does things, Beavis and Butthead. And because it almost kind of reflects a universal theme, too, because if you go back a little bit, you'll also find that a few years ago, at the same time, you'll also find, too, that uh, they, too, if we can pull them up here quickly a little bit more, had a lot of the same things. Bush and Cheney. Let's see if we can get this open here a little bit more. But you can kind of see the same thing. Bush and his constant war effort to go into Iraq. Cheney with his scheming attitude. Yeah, that too is good art. I will end with this. <laughs> but anyway, that's some of the best art I have seen in a long time, and many of you who follow me on the uh, College of Complexes blogs are good on it. You see, the thing is, a lot of times, too, art, this type of art goes way back. And if we can go back a little bit more to the Thomas Nast cartoons, you'll see some of the images here that he did. We can pull up something up here. The good ones he did at Tammany Hall and the trust busting. Let me see if I can get him up here a little bit more. This guy, maybe you can't really see it. I'll try to find a couple of larger images. But Thomas Nast, too, did a lot of good cartoons. Here's probably a, um, he does a lot of heavy political satire. And the reason he did this was a lot of the people were still somewhat illiterate at the time. Take a look at this one where he's uh, talking about the Republican vote. Caesar. Reform. Inflation. And how the Republicans are smashing down all of our institutions, acting like Caesar, and of course the billionaire predators in the background. Yeah. There's a lot of good art out there. And certain, certain images can produce a lot of meaning. So this is nothing new. If you go back to some of the political satire cartoons and art that had Lincoln around, that was great. And probably some of the best art I ever saw and its interpretation was when I, remember one time I was in the Art Institute. There were four blank canvases up there on a wall. I mean, they were just white canvases. And they were each supposedly something else. And this tour group is walking through, and I'm kind of going, Ah, oh, look at that art up there. Polar bear in snowstorm. You can, you can tell the richness of the bear up there. The tour guide is looking, and her jaw starting to drop. These people are starting to flock around me like I'm some kind of art critic. And I ended my little presentation, Polar Bear Snowstorm? It's all a matter of interpretation to me. And I said, you believe that? I got a nice bridge in Brooklyn to sell you too. They finally got it that it was a joke. And boy, you should have seen the face of the tour director. Thank you. Jim, Jim, tell me what. Boss tweets said about Thomas Nast cartoons. What did you say? What, 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 come enlighten us. My constituents can't read, but they can sure understand a damn picture. <laughs> That's great. My constituents can't read, but they sure can understand a damn picture. <laughs> All right. All up. I, uh, I have no rebuttal against the presentation, but I do have, I do have a, uh, a couple comments about art, and I find it uh, uh, 
in the context of uh, uh, the, the, the value society places on art, um, if you look at schools, you'll see that uh, kids are uh, uh, denied more and more access to uh, uh, classes in uh, art and uh, in music. And that's heartbreaking in, uh, in a society, especially with so many stressors um, on people nowadays. Art is a wonderful way to release uh, release some of those stresses, to express your creativity, to uh, connect with a community. When I was young, I remember that there were bars where you could go to and you stand around the piano with a drink in your hand and everybody's singing songs and they all know the songs. And, what I know of history, this had been going on for centuries where people would get together and sing and that kind of thing just doesn't really happen anymore. It's maybe part of that is technology where people uh, feel an obligation if to sound as good as the uh, electronically manipulated voices that are in some of popular music right now, but people are really so self-conscious, they just it's very hard for them to just join in or just sing, start singing, maybe the exception is if you're in church and you're singing hymns, uh, and I think that's kind of sad. The other thing that I thought of was, uh, recently this was in the news, is uh, uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel needed some money, so he decided to uh, do some quick cash by selling a mural. The mural was painted by an artist, some renown, and, uh, and the artist complained, he said, you asked me to to create this mural for you, for the city, and so there was a big up, uproar, and Emmanuel backed down, and the artist just said, I'm never doing another donation to any city again. So it, it's, uh, the it, people just really be, seem to be using, treating art less as a, a way of self-expression and community, and more as just a commodity, and I find that real sad. So uh, I did appreciate all the uh, art that was shown today. And all my final comment is, uh, I know this is just my personal opinion, but I think Bob looks like a college professor. So for what that's worth, thanks. Yeah, and he's a rambler. Oh, it's a rambler. No, no. Weren't you a teacher at Loyola? Were you a teacher at Loyola? Well, I was. Yeah. You're a rambler. All right. <laughs> Another rambler. I got two parts. Two parts. Well, they're just one. But, you know, who remembers Sister Wendy on PBS? Oh, yeah, I got her book. That was the most awesome <laughs> TV show ever. She's about an 80 year old nun. No, and who's was that fellow that says you can't have somebody interpret art? It's all for the individual. Both hogwash. Because I was in rock and roll bands, and to this day, I know when I hear crappy rock and roll bands that I know good rock and roll. But anyway, Russ, in the corner, raise your hand, pointed out Sister Wendy, and when Sister Wendy looked at a painting, I don't know art. I know rock and roll, but I don't know art. And she would point out so many damn things about one painting. And I said, yeah, I see it now. <laughs> and if you ever want to have an entertaining evening and watch reruns of Sister Wendy on PBS explaining what all these famous, um, what do you call these, these uh, classics are, <laughs> and she interprets it for you. I'm like, I'm not going to have no Sir Joe Schmo interpret it. She really did a wonderful job of interpreting the classics. So, yeah, government told me how to interpret art. <laughs> Uncontrolled. All right, next. Andy, if you want to go up there, we got some time. We got plenty, and we got a Give lot of time. Charlie. Give it to Charlie. Give it to Charlie, then. You ready, Charlie? We're going to go up there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we don't have time we don't have time. Oh, come on. We're in a rush. All right, Russ. Yeah, we're in a hurry. All right, Russ. Yeah. You guys know how to run things. Yeah, just a short one. We can't allow for announcements. We gotta hurry up. Horses are running. Who hurry? Just shit on my announcement. Remember, Adolf Hitler started as an artist. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 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 Oh.
All right, let's go back in the next three putter. It's an empty microphone. Yes. We'll be out here early tonight. I think so. It has some interesting comments, but uh, uh, kind of half and half. Um, for those people that don't appreciate what Bob did, uh, I would just like to say um, he's been my friend for many, many years, and I've learned a lot from him. Good. And um, that uh, he presented a lot more paintings than are in his books. Um, and um, so you guys got a really great treatment here. And um, yeah, I mean, there is interpretation to art, you know. Uh, Hitler, some of those uh, postcards he painted, some people looked at him afterwards and said, you know, okay, well, they're kind of ordinary, but you have to wonder um, if people had appreciated his art more and he had made a living as an artist, had a normal life, I mean, you know, we wouldn't have been subjected to maybe the Holocaust and uh, all the terrible things that happened from the denigration of his of, of his attempt to be in you know somebody that mattered in some way and you know he started he was just misunderstood he was he was maybe just misunderstood yeah right he was a great public speaker I don't present that as a likely occurrence but if um, if we had a better appreciation of art in this uh, country we would uh, I think we would all be better off I think if the public. And Bob is trying to do this. It's a, it's a, it's a noble effort. He's trying to make it easier for um, regular people, um, people that aren't don't get a class in appreciating art, appreciating art, don't get to go to museums as much. I mean, it's um, it's a matter of um, um, civilization. I mean, I remember the first program I really got into on PBS, um, Sister Wendy is Beautiful, but uh, was Kenneth Clark, um, a program about civilization, and he really brought to the forefront tremendous interpretation. Yeah, I have his book at home, I, I just wait for the opportunity when I retire, maybe, and maybe when this crisis is over in the country, uh, to really revisit that. Um, so, I mean, this is a very important topic, and um, and Bob has brought us here a um, an excellent presentation, um, and uh, I thank him for that. I'm going to go up a second time because Bob Lichtenberg made a comment. We don't have the time. It's going to be very brief. We have no time on the talk show. You see, the thing the is, he talks about art not That's being it. available in the suburbs. Yeah. You do. I'm going to show you a little something in my own hometown called Cornish Park. And we'll see, because we'll put a quick claim and an end to that, real quick. By one park? No, but if you, if you haven't been out to the suburbs lately, you will find that... Uh, You're not in the suburbs. You're in Iowa. Take a look at this. This is called... It's called, called Cornish Park. And if I can just get the, uh, sorry, yeah, I gotta get back to the Google thing. What this is called is Cornish Park. And what it, what it is, it's a riverfront park in Algonquin, Illinois, featuring this water tower. It's cost us about maybe two and a half million dollars to put in. But it's a, it was a clock tower and as far as the pavilions and some of the things, that's a view outside of Port Edward Restaurant. It's all been built up, turned into parks. Chicago has a lot of these things too. And it is my strong contention that if there's, he says there's no art in, in, in the burbs. There still isn't. Oh, you, well, Charlie, again, I'm gonna say, if you haven't been out there recently, you're missing quite a bit. What, the clock you can buy one of those clock towers. Charlie, only the best tasting tuna get to be seen. Is that the clock tower? No, this is on the riverfront. Fox River. On the Fox River. They've got. Uh, they've also got a lot more stuff here. 
at the factories. It's no, it's not factory. She Flow Engineering did this one too of, of recently here of the uh, clock tower. Anyway, but you know, it's just it's just some really good parks that have been out in the area. Here's probably one of the best shots that they've had. <laughs> That's not you, Tim. You know, and, uh, are there parking lots? <laughs> yes, there are, but uh, I can tell you the one thing about this park. Oh, yes, please. It's always been used. Oh, it's been. Uh, Here's a slide. Oh, that the playground. This park is used. And it's been very well. Uh, lots of wedding pictures. There's that bridge view from the bridge. And I'll tell you, a lot of times at night, I find myself just going down here just to contemplate a little bit. Look at all that art. You know, and. Uh, you go with that prayer. Uh, what was the prayer director? Or I'm never going to the art you know, you know. And, and, there, and there we go. So if anybody, that's, that's enough, that's all I need to say. Because I'm going to go to Algonquin. Go to Riverside. He said that he would never go to Algonquin again. It's too hard to miss him. Right. Okay. I'd like to thank Bob for uh, his presentation on art on canvas mostly. Uh, as uh, somebody commented, uh, you know, there's there's not a lot of museums out in the suburbs like there is in the city, so a lot of us don't have really access to a lot of the painted art. So I uh, get involved in, uh, you know, art. Uh, I'd like to say a few words about, you know, classic art from musicians or movie makers, mm -hmm. authors. Uh, it's a real, it's a work of art to produce a book, say, that somebody can understand mm -hmm. versus something that's incomprehensible. Uh, and there's been some classic movies that portray issues in unmistakable, just really memorable uh, portrayals that you know, once you see it, you never forget it. A, a movie that I saw back in 1968 that changed my life for the better when I was in the Army was called Man for All Seasons. Paul Schofield got the Oscar for playing Sir Thomas More in England. It was about honesty and ethics. Another classic from the 60s that captures the essence of the insanity of the military and political minds we're seeing today. That movie is more relevant today than it was in the 64 when it was made. It's called Dr. Strangelove. Just an all-time classic. Yes. Another one, uh, they had one uh, movie that was fiction when it was made in 1983. They foresaw the actual uh, world events that came to pass in 1987, four years later. That movie was War Games with Matthew Broderick. And uh, talking about uh, what would happen if the computers started playing games between themselves or if they were thinking that a country was under attack when it wasn't, when it was an illusion of some kind. And for those of you that have never seen War Games, it portrayed the two computers uh, being uh, on hair trigger launch on morning. And in the summer of 87, that was reality. Uh, Reagan and Gorbachev were on the phone every other day overriding the red alerts where their computers wanted to launch. <clears throat> so they shut the system down, and the Berlin Wall came down in 1989. A couple years later, and <clears throat> the Bush administration very quickly converted the Cold War into a war against Islamic terrorists starting in 1991. But general, in, in terms of books, uh, Smedley Butler wrote a book called War is a Racket. That book has been effectively suppressed by the mainstream corporate media in America since 1935 because it accurately describes in ordinary language anybody can understand a small book about who profits from war and who plays, who pays with their blood, sweat, and tears, and arms and legs, limbs, their lives. So there's a worldwide movement now to declare war obsolete. War is a racket was one of them. Uh, Professor Griffin has written 12 books on the myth of Islamic terrorism, starting with his first one was called The New Pearl Harbor. 12 books on the myth of 9-11 compared to the story that we were given. The rest of the world is working with it and they're moving on. Uh, 
you talk about uh, you know classic classic movies that describe in one two and a half hour period you can get the knowledge that it would take you 10 or 15 or 20 books to digest and that movie is Avatar you want to know what our troops are doing in Iraq and Afghanistan and everything else. All you have to do is watch that one, two and a half hour movie. It accurately portrays the military mind, it portrays the corporate mind. In there, the corporate owner that's in, in charge of the mining operation, he says, well, we don't want to kill those indigenous people to move them off those rich ore deposits. We'd like to figure out some way to move them without killing them because the stockholders don't like to see a bunch of uh, dead civilians on the books. But if we can't move them off, well, we got to kill them because uh, profits come first. It's nothing personal. We just need our billions. And that's what we're working on a, a briefing paper called uh, Action Speak Louder Than Words. What are American corporations, the top 50 companies, especially the oil companies, telling us with their actions? Forget the rhetoric. The oil companies and both the pharmaceutical industry, they're saying, well, we're sorry your kids are dying from pollution or lack of medicine. We're sorry your kid's dying because you can't afford the uh, surgery, but we need our billions. It's not personal. It's just business. It's a business of unregulated, billionaire-driven, vampire capitalism. That's the only way to describe it. And we still, the country is still divided between people that haven't stepped through the barrier and looked at this reality. People that are on uh, one side of the barrier thinking capitalism was the greatest thing since sliced bread where take a look at, log on to any of the protesters anywhere in the world talking about climate change. They're saying capitalism is the driving force be behind the destruction of the environment. If we don't address that and tell the billionaires they have to be satisfied with the billions they have now, we have to stop burning fossil fuel. The billionaires are going to, some of them are going to have to be happy with a billion or so. Can't make another 10 or 20 billion and uh, have the sea level come up 20 feet around Miami in 30 or 40 years. But that's what we're looking at. All the current studies show we got 12 years. Uh, many of us will still be around in 20, 30, 11 years actually. We, we, in, 11, in 11 years we'll know if our grandkids have any viable future at all. Yeah. So that's what's protesting all over the world. And it's the same thing going through the knowledge of what happened with asbestos and uh, what happened with uh, lead boys in Flint, Michigan. <clears throat> and what, what's happened with trying to build nuclear waste deposits in various states. When people find out what the facts are, they get out and protest and shut the operation down. So there's, uh, as I said earlier tonight, I'll, I'll close with <clears throat> the Sunrise Movement, uh, the Extinction Rebellion in, in all through Europe. There's all kinds of young groups, different groups forming with uh, websites. Tens of millions of young people are already protesting and uh, they're heading toward uh, numbers five or ten times that big within the next few years to do something about climate change. So uh, there we are. So you log on to Common Dreams, that one new site is still the best of the best for telling us, uh, showing good things that are happening all over the place without the junk you get on mainstream corporate America. Uh, that's too loud, isn't it? He couldn't hear? Can everybody else hear? That That seems like a loud echo coming from back there. That's too loud. That's too loud. Turn it down. Turn it down. Turn it down. A little there. bit. There we go. A little okay. bit louder. That, that's, that's good, right? Yeah, right there. All right. Well, um, the last thing I would say is that those of you that... Every now and then you'll see an artist in sports They'll produce something that is an absolute work of art and they set a world record or something or I have a game that was never surpassed or uh, some of Sam Snead shot a 59 one day at golf and the, the next day he shot a 63 and uh, the papers wrote, Snead blows up and shoots a crappy 63 where 59 was the course record the day earlier. He said, just like the ball had eyes. And if you're a, a skilled sportsman, like Michael Jordan hitting all those threes in one game, it seems like you can't miss. You have to they call it being in the zone. Uh, and anybody that plays a sport of any kind will recognize that feeling where one day all those signs just come together and you can't do anything wrong. And you might have one day like that in 10 or 15 years of playing the sport. It's like, uh, like Theo Epstein in 2016 with the Cubs World Series victory. Yeah. 
or uh, was it the Boston Red Sox? That same came from guy. Nine, three, yep. One? Same manager, Theo produced, Epstein. Uh, something just a, a total miracle. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's there's good art all around us, yes. not just on canvas. If you know, if you just keep your eyes open and know what to appreciate. Oh, one last thing. There's uh, a new movie out for uh, those of you that haven't seen it yet. Uh, my money is on uh, the actress that played uh, a wife. It's a called A Quiet Place with Emily Blunt. And there's a scene in there where she gives birth to a baby while trying to maintain total silence because there was a, a creature, uh, a monster nearby that hunts by sound. That is the most realistic looking portrayal of a woman giving birth. It looked absolutely real. I, I, uh, everybody just says, give her the Oscar now. Like uh, Hillary, Hillary Swank played a, a boxer at Million Dollar Baby. Iconic performance. What did they, what did they the new movie is called A Quiet Place. It's one of the best things that came out. It came out in uh, April or March or April this year, early. So it will be up for the Academy Awards next year. But if you haven't seen that, uh, it's, it's thoroughly entertaining. So um, that's about all I got. Oh, uh, there's three. You know, we talk about songs, music. There's you know all kinds of classic songs, but there are some songs that move people and change the political debate in the direction the country was moving in. And that was back in the '60s when Peter, Paul, and Mary and some of the others uh, started with protest songs. If I had a hammer, was one. Blowing in the wind was another one. Arlo Guthrie produced a thing called Alice's Restaurant. Arlo Guthrie Jr. They play it on Thanksgiving. It's it's the one of the all-time classic anti-war movements that captures the essence of going down to the draft board and trying to deal with the insanity of, of the draft. I mean, it's just it's brilliant. So uh, there's all kinds of good art being produced, trying to push the human race in a positive direction. Yep. So uh, that's and of course uh, you can't. There were some really good artistic portrayals of what a just, fair society would look like on Star Trek, The Next Generation. Don't forget Robert Stone, Pandora's Promise. I don't know who Robert Stone is. He's not widely known to me. Uh, what year was Robert Stone uh, publishing? Uh, what are you talking about? Movie director. Famous. Well, but what movies did he produce? Quite a bit. Google them right now, you'll see. Name one famous, really famous movie he produced. Escaping my head right now, but I do know there's quite a bit. One of my favorites in his genre is called Pandora's Promise. And how old is that movie? Less than two years old. I think less than three years old now. It didn't hit the movie theaters, did it? It hit, made a big, made a big thing with the Thorium crowd. Pandora's. Okay, it's Pan a movie about Thorium. Right, yeah. No, it's Pandora's Promise. It's about why several people who were anti-nuke became pro-nuke once they realized the true facts behind nuclear power. It's a really good movie. Robert Stone? Robert Stone, I believe. He might be there with Fred Cease and Fred Singer, two physicists. Long-time physicists that had uh, high credibility in the physics department. In the 19, about 1970, they started taking money from the tobacco industry to use their credit credentials to produce reports saying there's no problem with secondhand smoke, no problem with cigarette smoke. It is and then not, that, nothing to do with anything. Well, okay. You got any other examples than that? Ferris Bueller's Day yeah, Off. Uh, Fred, yeah, that's why I said. One regulation. What? Only what, what is one regulation proof of anything? That the government can regulate something? Uh, no, the... Uh, I mean, there's a thousand regulations. The Mr. Smith goes to, to Washington. Washington. When uh, people are dying needlessly. That's all I'm saying. Children, children young babies don't have, uh, they don't have the ability to say whether they want to smoke or not. There's no proof there. If you do a Google search of secondhand smoke, the there's, no there's about 80,000 hits. So if you keep telling me there's no there's no proof of that. There isn't. That's that's 100 percent provably false. I was involved in the regular informing that reg. Well, you should look at the new information. In Washington. Look at the new Where were you? <laughs> I was here. You I read about it. I was working on the anti-nuclear campaign. We knew there was no proof. To say there's no proof of secondhand smoke is 100 percent false. But Charlie keeps saying that over and over. 
just to irritate me. And I say, Charlie, why do you present yourself as I being dumber than a fifth grader? I represented the employees of that unit. Look at me. I'm dumber than a fifth grader. Why do you say that, Charlie? I know the unit where that came from. It doesn't matter where the unit it came from. It's been superseded Direct by Direct experience doesn't Charlie. count. Charlie, only the best tasting tuna get to be star cast. Science moves forward in the direction of truth. It's not there. At one time, a whole bunch of scientists well, believed that nuclear power was going to be clean, safe, and too cheap to meter. Those same scientists learn the reality. The same thing as modern science shows that the belief that secondhand smoke is not harmless, that's been totally rendered a crack no. enforcement. Yes. Secondhand smoke is being banned all over the world. Doesn't mean on what basis? On the basis of the studies that show no. that it's harmful to children. Right, let's get okay. On the basis that all we right. don't want to die of cancer. First of all, I represented the employees of EPA where that smoking not thing came from. And he doesn't want to listen. It was my unit. And they came up with this, they wanted to have no smoking. And they couldn't prove it. They had no study. What year was that, Charlie? Back in the 90s. And I represented those employees. And I also represented the employees who smoked. And I was involved in it. And this was the trade-off. I said, let's go ahead. There are all sorts of things about smoking room, smoking outside, and all this. And they thought, because I smoked, I would not agree to it. I would I sign to have no smoking in the offices. And I said, yes. And I signed off on it. I had direct experience. They had no proof. They had no studies. Perhaps it's a, well, it might affect children. I go, well, we don't have children in our offices. So it doesn't pose any harmful thing. As a matter of fact, if you want to know the deal was, at the time, it goes back so many years, that I got computers. I said, I'll stop smoking. I could smoke in my own office. I was, my own office was excluded. But I cut the deal and we did a trade-off and I wanted computers for all reunion office across the country. And I'll sign off and we can have the smoking thing and go on. And they did. And that's how the computers get you didn't we didn't they didn't have to give us computers. And that was the whole story behind it. So there was no proof. No proof at all. What year, Charlie? I, you, okay, when did computers come in? That is immaterial. You're talking about 1992. 92. That was when the government regulation came out offering buildings across the country. I'm involved in the public building service. General services. Are you doubting me? Public no, building no, I'm not service. 6,800 buildings. And I had to decide whether or not there was smoking in them or not. You know, what do you think? I'm making this up. <laughs> No, what, I, I don't know. Charlie, what, I, fuck, I what the you. fuck year does it matter? I agree with you 100%. What year does it matter? You want me to go home and look it up? I'll go to my office next week and I'll, and I'll look up what year. Is that, why is that important? Stand up and tell me why that is important. It's important because they've had 25 years of research since then. That this no, 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 that's what I'm no. No, no, no. We didn't have yeah. it then. You and your whole thing is that there was a regulation and you had proof. And the regulation came about because they had proof, and they had no proof, and they still don't have proof. Believe me, they went for it. Okay, I'll bring you some. They had nice none. Stuff. That's wrong, Charlie. No, and none of your idiot. I'm not going to take no, shit. No, no, none of your okay. internet nonsense. Okay, not that loud. Inter internet nonsense. Okay. The, all you got research on is the internet. All right, Charlie. Silly. Go ahead. All right, let's time. thank Bob. Uh, that's what I mean. I, I, I've listened to the story so many times, and I don't know what one regulation. He had enough. He cited a regulation. I subscribe to the thing where I get regulations issued by the government every day. And I'm going, well, this one is telling, not telling the truth about. Uh, there are deals that cut, and there's an interesting story about how regulations come into that. And uh, what does it mean? We don't, the proof of government regulations is proof of what? The government can do it, you know. We regulate a million things. Car safety, foods, 
Who knows what? Water state. Alright. Um, All right. Let's think about for We're a nice possible. presentation. Sure. Right. Yeah. 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 Get up there, Bob. 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 Get up I had never spent, and I never took any courses in, in, in school, at, at any level, in anything regarding art. And for some reason, I took it upon myself to learn art. And I was fortunately able to go to the lectures at noon at the Art Institute and I well attended anywhere between no less than 500 to 1,000 of those over the years. That's why I was announcing, trying to announce one tonight uh, that was coming up interpreting works of art pertaining to Christmas. I had a pass for every museum in the United States. I went on, went crazy on this. I went out east on tours going to art museums, I went to gallery openings, subscribed to publications, and I purchased any number of piles of books. Sister Wendy's got a good book. It's kind of unique in the sense that she looks out particular parts of a painting and draws a line and then explains that aspect of the painting. The only thing I don't like about Sister Wendy is I don't like her choice of paintings or artworks. Now that's neither here nor there. That's not to discredit her. But she picks out certain works of art that I'm not particularly interested in. But that's her choices, and you know, it's her program and her book. You know, which, which ones do you focus on as illustrating the word of art? Now, the one thing that makes art interesting is that it, it defines a, a culture. It defines a civilization. It, it defines a period in history unlike anything else. You can look at artworks in the Middle Ages and you wonder what those people were. And you look at what they used to create their art in, with. You know, they carved wood and things like this in the Middle Ages. Later on you see classical, academically trained artists in Europe. You can say, well, this is, this is a sophisticated culture here. Guys like John Singer Sargent, you know, were well-trained academic classical painters. And then you come along with this modern art. And you got to say, what is this saying about our country and our period of uh, a time that these things? Uh, somebody mentioned, like, what is art? Uh, the art the shop said, I, I'm the artist. I'm the only one who can tell you what a work of art is, and which one is it? You know, he said, I'm the I'm an expert. You know, so he he did it. But um, now the other thing is, yes, there's one thing about art is that it incorporates symbols. And symbols are graphic things that have meaning. The only thing is, you need to know what that symbol means. It's not evident by itself, particularly in things like the religious paintings. There's all sorts of symbols incorporated in the artwork that, unless you know the meaning of it, you don't know why it's there. And I, the closest he came to it tonight was there was something about the birds there. And I don't know if that's really a good example. But very often, if you see, you have to know the symbols. And every, every society and civilization develops its own symbolism. Um, we see it in like patriotic symbolism. Um, Tell you what, we see it here. This is kind of symbolic here. And we know that that's what? What is that? It just a, a dark headed guy or or what? What what is what obviously here is a hat? You know, so what is he? You know? So perhaps in our in our word we see the symbols there of the diploma and they, they put a symbol of the poem and, then, and a graduation cap, and we say, well, this is someone who's a graduate, you know. So you can see right there. But anyhow, that's kind of the fun of art. Anybody can do it uh, at any given time. I highly recommend 
Now, uh, I don't know the criteria of the clock tower. <laughs> is uh, architecture is its own world and tr attracts enormous numbers of people. Uh, you know, um, the it it's it's a separate area that draws many many people. I don't know if the the uh, the factory clock tower that. Matter of fact, I don't know why would you put a clock tower in a park when it's kind of a leisure time. To clock towers before you had to get someplace, and it was to ensure that you weren't late. <laughs> so I don't know why it would be in a park, but the guys in Algonquin or wherever that was, you know, uh, did it. But we're surrounded by art. Um, Actually, one of the fun things that I do, if you look on the website for the rail, the railroad club is the artwork and the logos of all the railroads oh, yeah. in the United States, which are kind of me, kind of fun because they all had little different things. He's got one on right now. Mm -hmm. He's wearing one of Pennsylvania Keystone, you know, which just by that, you know, that's the Keystone State and that, that logos on there. But um, that's just the one of the things that I deal with. Anyhow, thank you very much. It was a nice panorama of the highlights of the Art Institute. And uh, they are, for me, it's Tuesday and Thursday evenings, if I recollect the Art Institute is free. I don't know, I heard there. Um, I don't, it, otherwise, it is enormously expensive. It, it, it ain't, it's like 20, 35 dollars. So you're going to have to watch for holidays or look that up, uh, unless you want to pay the price. Anyhow, Andy, uh, if you've got evidence on smoking, but where, where is he even left? Um, I'm sorry, that I've heard that example many times, and that's the, the whole story. There was no evidence at the time, and that certainly does not establish the fact. That shows how politics works, and I thought it was the right thing to do. You know, and I, you know, the story here that there was overwhelming evidence, the fact of the matter is, there was absolutely no evidence at the time. But we knew that smoking was perhaps bad for people, and maybe it'd be a good idea not, not to be parental, but uh, to do away with it. We, got, we had plenty of evidence that smoking was bad. So I don't know what this second hand, we actually had no smoke. You know, one of the proposals, as a matter of fact, was, you could smoke at your desk as long as you didn't walk around the office. That's what I mean. He's telling me there was so much evidence of secondhand smoke. That was on the table and agreed to at one point that an employee could sit at, like, you could smoke at a table as long as you didn't get up and walk around. So that's what I mean. Uh, anyhow, thank you very much. All right, Bob gets the final word. Let's give our speaker a, a good hand for the final word. Um, 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 I know it's smoking is to an art. We shouldn't talk about anything at the college of Complex. Smoke rings. Yeah. And the seekers never verges from the topic. Well, close to the topic. I made sure we do that. So, I urge you to come to that. Uh, thank you very much for your comments and your rebuttals. Appreciate them all. Appreciate your coming, listening to this topic. Um, it's a very important topic, as Doug said. It's one of the greatest human endeavors. It shows a lot of imagination, creativity, the high mental faculties, and um, something unique to humans. Um, the art of the deal. Now, Tim, I'm talking about um, the fine arts. Not it's 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 a book. I yeah. defined all my terms that carefully at the start. <laughs> I defined all my terms carefully at the start. Yeah, that's uh, something you should always do from a logical point of view. Right. Um, there's very little art in the suburbs. There's very little art in the city. All we care about is money and things, pretty much, in our society, our stupid society. 
Um, uh, um, it's good, it's good. There's, um, yeah, Charlie's right, symbols are very important. I should have talked more about those. They open up new levels of reality. Um, uh, I implore you to read the handout. A lot of you weren't following along with me. I implore you to take it home and read it. A lot of information in there. I put a lot of work into that. Studied out for many years. Um, um, okay, I guess I'm ready to say. Well, Sister Wendy gave her own interpretations of art, and that's fine. Everyone's welcome to interpretation. I made that very clear. You just read the handout. If you listen, you hear that. Kenneth Clark. Excellent commentator on art. He went more by um, history, less on his opinions. But it's pretty much our interpretation is our opinions, and most of our knowledge is most, almost all of our knowledge and matters whatsoever is strictly opinions. Wow. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. Just be careful with it. Just analyze it carefully using the laws of logic and give it lots of thoughts. Very important domain of um, human knowledge. So it's a lot of it, it's just opinions. There's nothing wrong with that. It's good that we can make them and talk about them like we do here, try to agree on them. As far as these being my interpretations, of course, I emphasize that. It says my interpretations in big letters. And then right before I started, one of my said, now anyone can interpret art any way they want, you're all welcome to it, as long as they base it on the artwork <laughs> to some extent. Okay, and to say that this is the most boring talk you that someone's ever heard, you know, that could only come from a very boring mind. If, you, if, if you're bored by information like this, you know, there's really very little that will be of interest to you. Um, that was the most very boring most boring rebuttal I ever heard in this stupidest response. Um, only some mentally deficient mind um, would, would find that boring, and it's more a reflection of that mind than anything else. Um, can David even read? Did he read my hand out? No, I don't think he did. No, I don't think he heard me. His mind must have been tripping. I don't know where the hell it was. Cause my interpretations force. I don't force them on anyone. I just said what they were. That's not forcing them. I'm just saying what they are. I think you missed the whole point. I hope you didn't, but um, thanks again for coming and sharing uh, your ideas and trying to learn. It's a ray of hope for me that people are still interested in this. Today. Thank you very much. Good night. Yeah. Hold this out, Andy. Thank you. Okay, uh, that's it for tonight for the College of Complexes. We will see you all next week, and we're out. Uh,